Good morning. Uh, this is, we're going to come to the end of black on white today. I, I'll ask you to start. That's where I ask you to stop, and, and this time go to the end. Uh, uh, it's going to be, I think, um, no, I think it's going to be completely in Philadelphia. No, maybe Harlem and Philadelphia. Mr. Spoons, you'll, that, that was uh, the guy's nickname. You, you'll see him. He's an improviser. He's improvising. Uh, improvising with rhyme, spontaneous. One of the reasons that I've used this before with students was it, it, it's dealing with poetry, improvised poetry, and I think it's automatically more interesting. Martin Luther King Jr., you'll, you'll see him, uh, <coughs> uh, an, you know, an example of his use of words. He was, a, of course, a preacher, and preachers in general were men of words. I mean, they almost have to be men of words. If they're not, they're, they're not going to be very good preachers. Now, I'm not so sure outside the black community if the same would apply, but I, th I think it really does. These two go together. And in this book, I didn't mention it, and I'm not going to really go into it, but one of the things that, uh, that uh, Smitherman says, uh, explains about is in, in uh, for example, Southern Baptist churches, there, there's a call and response uh, relationship between the preacher and the uh, audience. Uh, well, I, I don't have time to go into that. Uh, He's going to say that non-standard English is what generates change. Uh, education <coughs> is, is almost uh, part, it's something I, I really had trouble with, I, I guess, all my life and didn't maybe even know it, that education's role was to stop change. It was so conservative, uh, I mean, in, in so many ways, certainly regarding language. Uh, stop change, slow change up. But that's where the change does come from, from the non-standard English. And then I sort of launched into this thought about standardizing. Maybe that's one of the culprits for me in that background quest that I said uh, of my trying to find out why the, does the beauty uh, fade away. Maybe it's because things became standardized. Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, a man that you're going to hear speaking very careful standard English. After the woman uh, who was the superintendent of schools in Philadelphia, after her, a man sitting on a bench outside, and he's going to say, th uh, "Thother, thother," and uh, I think he slipped up because he's he's being so careful to speak standard English. Uh, uh, he didn't say "thother," uh, but here's how you would spell what he said: the other. And I think in the most careful of standard English, you would say, the other, the other, father. But that's what I hear him say. Uh, it would be something just to listen for if you wanted to and see if you're here ears, ears, uh, the way I, I say it. He does not say tada. He, he does not say that. That would be even less formal. Now, he and, and uh, others, Robert McNeil especially, talks about code switching. I use that. Uh, I use the word register. That's the linguistic term that I learned for that. Uh, you're just like an organ has got different stops. You can pull out and you can play an organ in different registers. Well, speech is like that too. Uh, you have different registers depending upon with whom you're speaking, uh, who you're speaking with. You see, I could I could say that either way. Uh, code switching or code shifting, he he calls it, uh, as a guy goes from street talk to, to talking to uh, the interviewer, Robert McNeil probably. Uh, you'll see beatbox. Uh, of course, <laughs> I remember when that, this, <clears throat> this came out in the 80s, and I remember uh, rap uh, was a brand new thing about eight, uh, 1978 or so. It was very new at that time. Beatbox and breakdancing, you'll see that. And then he refers to these rappers as like ghetto homers. And I really latched on that, and I grabbed that, and I used that. I used to use that as an excuse to jump to the modern time when I was teaching about the Iliad uh, and epics, uh, the great epics, the Iliad, the Odyssey, Beowulf, because I tried to, to uh, get across to the students that these epic singers were illiterate. They, they were not... They didn't memorize that and then read it or read something and memorize it. They made it up spontaneously. And he points that out. They're like ghetto rappers. They can, for 45 minutes at a stretch, spontaneously create poetry. And then right at the end, Walt Whitman is mentioned. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to stress that I, I think it's a theme, really, throughout the whole story of English. 
uh, it's I almost wrote an anti-academic, unacademic. The real interest uh, in this in the story of English comes out of not out of the schools, not not of not, not out of academia. Uh, in French, in France, for example, the um, oh, what is it? The something Francaise, Acad l'Académie Française. It, its whole goal <laughs> was to not let French change. And uh, uh, so anyway, you'll see that. All right, well, I hope you've enjoyed this. This uh, episode five is a, a particularly interesting one to me, but I'm going to go on to the other ones too next week. Uh, see you.